Well, welcome to Rob's Old Garage. Actually, I'm down here at Rob's Cheers right now, bar and grill. But anyhow, uh, we're working on my 1948 Plymouth Flathead. And there's a lot of things that's been going on that I've been doing with it. Uh, just getting it back on the road. It's been sitting for over 20 years, so I had to go through the brakes. You know, it's got the old Lockheed brakes on it. Uh, I had to build a tool to be able to do those as well. Uh, so I'm giving you an idea. This is a blog that I'm doing, you know, on this car that I, you know, and I'm going to show you more videos in detail uh, here in the uh, near future on everything I'm going through with it and what I've done. So I get the brakes good, uh, suspension is okay. I, I actually do want to do the shock upgrade where I mount it to the frame of the vehicle, you know, the upper half to the frame of the vehicle instead of to the upper control arms to give me a little bit better handling out of it. Uh, I'll be honest with you, this is the oldest car I have ever owned. Uh, I actually fell in love with it. Uh, most of the stuff I've worked on has been from 1960s on up. So, you know, small block Chevys, uh, old, you know, Ford 300 straight sixes or, you know, 235 I've uh, worked on. I've actually worked on a few 235s, but mostly have been 250 inline sixes and then on up all the way to 2012. Uh, you know, this car has been a challenge for me. I, I hate to say it. Something that was built way back then, as simple as it is, and finding out like the timing, I, I had no timing pointer on the front cover, so I could not use a timing light to time this thing. And then once I finally did go through and use the dial indicator, you know, uh, on on these engines, on these flatheads, number six cylinder has a plug right, in, you know, top right over the piston. So you can put a dial indicator instead instead and run it up and find your true top dead center, which is what I did. I had to pull the radiator back out again, do all that, and then I welded a brand new timing pointer on the cover because it was missing. You know, timing marks were on the damper, but there was no way to reference it, so I had to do a timing pointer. So I did that and found out my timing was 25 degrees advanced. Uh, and I was amazed that... I didn't blow a rod bearing or something with that much advance because the motor did not sound happy or healthy at that point. You know, I was babying, I wasn't running it hard, but I had to take it out for a good 50, 75 mile drive. And I brought it back. I'm like, man, something just don't seem right about this. So I did all that and found out, yeah, the timing was out of whack. So I reset all that. I got it back where I have it at four degrees at, uh, before top dead center. Uh, factory is right at top dead center. But with the fuel we use today, with the ethanol, everything else, you're able to run anywhere from four to seven degrees. I went on the safe side, set it four, just try it out. I went it out, and wow, what a difference. The throttle response is absolutely amazing. It revs, it's so nice and smooth. Um, so getting that done, you know, tune up parts in it, getting all that back, you know, up to spec. Now, granted, this is an original six volt positive ground car, and I thought about changing it over to twelve volt, but I, I you know, I realized the six volt system's working beautifully. Uh, you know, if I needed to redo, rewire it or whatever, I'm going to rewire it with the same gauge wiring, or I might actually go with. Uh, there's a company out there, I can't remember the name of it right now, but they make an actual wiring harness for the car that is the original cloth coated wiring, you know, and proper color codes, everything like that. Now, me, myself, I can actually rewire it and use the same gauge and put a fuse box in the whole nine yards because I'd rather have that kind of stuff in place, you know, for safety reasons. Uh, but anyways, for right now, the car is running beautifully. Uh, it stops okay. I mean, I, I made a tool for the brakes. I did get the brakes uh, situated, you know, 700 something dollars later. And this is without drums. So I'm going to keep you updated on videos with it. But I am looking at power improvements. And as a previous video that I just did that I'm going to 
show you of what I'm going to do and try it out. Uh, the problem that you have with these inline sexes like this is the intake track is so long that you got to be careful on how you do things because number one, without a heated intake, your fuel droplets aren't going to stay in suspension. They're going to drop. So your center cylinder, you know, two cylinders is a Siamese port. The three cylinder, you know, three ports for six cylinders. You're going to end up running dog rich in the center, you know, two cylinders. And on your ends, you're going to run lean. You don't want to do that. Uh, biggest improvement you can do over that, yes, is to put three individual carburetors, one over each port. That is, you know, to me is a win. That's the, you know, best way to go about it. But on a budget, what I've got is a Weber two-barrel carburetor. I got a 38 uh, DJAS. I've had good luck with them. I'm really good at tuning them. Uh, I got an adapter that I'm going to port match. And I'm going to port match the intake because you know, I notice the gasket is slightly bigger. So I'm going to try to port match and round the ports where they transition smoother. But you got to be careful because these intakes, the castings are thinner on the center section. And you have all that exhaust heat going up there. You don't want to go too thin because you can end up cracking it, you know, from getting too hot. So th there are certain things you got to be careful with. But I'm going to try this out and I'm going to keep you guys updated and see how it works out. If it don't work out, I'm not destroying a factory intake manifold. That's why I bought a spare to do this. And I found out too that the intake that I bought has a lower mounting point for the carburetor versus the one that's on my vehicle now, which will help me because I have a little wiggle room because I want the carburetor to sit roughly at the same height with the throttle linkage that way I have an easier time hooking everything up. I don't want to mod the factory stuff. Now, if I have to build the throttle rod going to the carburetor, I will make that. That way I don't destroy the original stuff. It's, it's just something you just don't want to do. On a car that's 75 years old, you want to be able to keep the original equipment you know, the best way you can. And believe it or not, with the Carter B&B, it runs pretty good now. It... Yeah, throttle response is great. It's got plenty of power to pull on traffic. Uh, it gets up, you know, 40 miles an hour very, very quickly. Uh, but if you do get down the throttle, there's just not much there. And I'm not looking at making a race motor out of it. I am looking at just giving a little bit more, you know, pep, see the pants, uh, but keeping it reliable and keeping it to its original specifications. These motors were noted for their reliability and that's something, you know, that's important to keep that, you know, at the same time. Rebuilding one of these engines is not cheap. It's not something you can just, you know, unless it's telling the cylinders, put new rings. No, if you blow a rod trying to find a rod, let alone a crankshaft, or anything like that gets rather expensive. So you got to be careful on what you do and do things the right way the first time. That way it stays reliable. You can have many years of service out of it and still have plenty of power, have a little fun with it, you know. So I will keep you updated on everything. And thank you guys for watching. Please like and subscribe. This is something new to me too. So I'm going to share my knowledge with you as I go. And uh, we'll go from there. So see you later.